Hi, everybody. This is Bob Ost, and it's um, June 11th, Friday, June 11th. Um, this one, I'm easier. it's easier for me to remember because yesterday was my anniversary. I had my 33rd anniversary yesterday. Um, so, so there, everyone. It can Woo! happen. It is possible. Um, so everybody, uh, keep yourself muted. Don't, don't hoo-hoo, because it means that the, you disrupt my, my YouTube video. <laughs> um, so uh, we are here uh, every week. We've been doing this since April 17th, 2020. Um, we're now looking at the, 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 very, the, the likelihood, in fact, the, the almost inevitab inevitability that we're actually going to be go going live again um, as, a, as a country. We're going to actually be doing things outside and, and in, in theaters and all sorts of things that we used to do. Um, we have to actually re-socialize ourselves. We're going to have to learn how to be together in, in, in rooms and in spaces instead of on Zoom. Um, so uh, I, as I said last week, I, I think I'm going to continue to do this Zoom, this virtual meeting every week or every other week, perhaps. Um, I'm also going to look at maybe doing it at a different time because it's possible that people are going to have jobs. People are actually going to have jobs and, and they're not going to be available at 430. Good Lord, the world, what is the world coming to? Um, but uh, we, we want to be able to continue to see people and mm -hmm. be with people that are outside of the New York area. Um, I, I've been <laughs> New York centric way too long. Um, and it's great now to uh, be able to meet people that are in Barcelona, Anya, Anna, it's so good to have you from Barcelona. We have people that come in from Malaysia and Australia and England and, and all over the place. And I can't do that in a theater space. I have to do it on Zoom. So um, meanwhile, we've been doing this and providing what I hope has is, is been an, uh, a useful haven for people to come and not feel so alone during what has been a shutdown for so long. And um, today uh, we're going to continue in a series of conversations that I've had uh, in my awareness, in my new awareness that New York is not the only place where theater happens. Um, so we've been doing something called uh, the regional perspective. Uh, and and uh, it's been feeding my new awareness and making me very happy to actually know about what is going on outside of New York. Um, we have two guests today that uh, it just happens to be this way, but I thought it was so interesting that one of them is is uh, running a brand new theater, and the other one is sort is running a theater that's been around forever. I mean, it's been all it's like nineteen twenty seven. Is that right, Joe? I mean, good lord. Um, so these are two very different uh, models, theaters. They're they're very two different uh, experiences. I, I I bet that you've been going through because of COVID. Um, so I brought you into the room now. Now my YouTube people can see all three of us. And um, why don't you introduce yourselves and tell us a little bit about your backgrounds and how you wound up where you are. Because, Joe, I may be wrong, but I don't think you started at Cape Cut Playhouse in 1927. Uh, that's that's correct. I started in 1928. Um, no, but I... Um... Yeah, I actually uh, started this uh, all all of this theater stuff uh, as a performer. Um, I started dancing when I was three, and um, I was a dancer for a very long time. And went to school for musical theater, um, performed for a long time. But my uh, my love, even as a performer, was when I was in projects when uh, they were in a developmental phase, or a reading, or a festival, or something like wherever the creatives were in the room that was where I wanted to be. And I think I've, I finally came around to realize that that was my producer brain waking up um, and saying, oh, this is this is actually what you want to do. You want to help tell the story from the ground up. And um, so I, I just started, um, you know, reaching out to producers in the industry and asking if they would give me a little of their time and tell me about their journeys to producing. And I was absolutely amazed at the generosity of um, people that I was just cold calling and saying, hey, I, you've won four Tonys, so you probably know what's going on. Would you, will you talk to me for a minute? <laughs> and, and they would. Um, and it was, it was really remarkable. Um, so uh, I got a lot of advice and um, 
and tried producing, you know, a reading here or there just to kind of dip my toe in it to it. And uh, my first big leap was um, on the musical The Prom, uh, which is on Broadway and uh, is on Netflix right now. If you are looking for something good to watch in Pride Month, it is certainly the perfect uh, film to watch right now. Um, and uh, and then from the prom, I, I worked as a co-producer on that, but I was also the associate to the lead producers. And uh, there were three lead producers on that project who lived in uh, three different time zones. And uh, there were seven agencies on the project. So we kind of needed someone to just sort of hold the ground um, a little bit and make sure all information was funneled in the right way. So that that was me on that project. And um, and it was, a, it was an incredible experience, uh, such a learning ground and, um, and really changed my perspective a lot. And from there, uh, the Cape Playhouse was looking for a new uh, executive director. And, um, and I started having conversations with them about um, the Playhouse. It's, it's just an amazing theater. Like you said, it's been around since 1927. Um, when it was built, it was made to be a home for Broadway artists to go in the summer, because at that time, Broadway houses didn't have air conditioning. So they would close down in the summer. And all of these incredible Broadway people had nowhere to go. So uh, this theater was created on Cape Cod, where it was nice and cool, and um, you know the climate was accommodating to theater, even indoors. And um, and so the performers who have been through that stage, every time I step on that stage, I just think about everyone who's walked there. And we have the Gertrude Lawrence dressing room that we keep for her. Her soul so, hangs around our ghost light. So um, I just want to ask you something. Yeah. How much do you miss performing in the other aspects of what you were, what you were doing before you discovered your producer, your your inner producer? Uh, and by the way, I want to actually editorialize about that and say say to to the rest of the room that um, th this is this is not an unusual journey for people. I mean, a lot of people discover that they love producing. So all of you artists in the room who are part of what we call self producing artists, the spa, you're, uh, and and we call that the spa, Joe and Dan, because we know that it's incredibly relaxing to self-produce. Um, so uh, all of you who are thinking, oh, God, why do I have to produce myself? Some people actually like that. And you actually might, if you, if you just relax into it, you might actually enjoy producing. Uh, I know I do. And I'm a, I'm a writer. I'm a playwright, composer, lyricist. And I discovered producing and I, I, I love it. I actually love it. I don't do it that often because I'm running true all the time. <laughs> um, so, uh, so how how do you feel uh, about the, the other part of you? Well, you know, it's an interesting point you make that um, that so many artists do like it because truly, if you as an artist are a storyteller, then you're going to love producing because you get to tell the story um, and and help decide how it's told and who it connects with and. Um, and really drive that home. And that's what I always was, even as a dancer, um, you know, I was in a modern dance company for a long time and modern dance is all about the story. Um, so, uh, you know, that that's how I approach it. So um, yes, there are aspects of performing that I, that I miss, you know, I actually really miss not putting on my tap shoes every day because um, that was my favorite thing in the world. Um, but, uh, but I, you know, I love the, I love using my brain in this different way um, I love the challenge of it. Um, I, I love that I get to help really shape what this thing is. Um, and that I'm allowed to say something when I want to shape it, as opposed to when I was a performer and I would walk up to the director and say like, Hey, you know, I think it'd be really cool if we tried this thing. And then they would, you know, not hire me again. Um, <laughs> so, so it's, it's a really, um, it's a, I, I enjoy being in this being in this space and trying to figure out um, everything that there is because it's so multifaceted. It is very creative, um, you know. If you want it to be, if you want to, I mean, there are different ways that you can approach producing. So if you want it to be very creative, it can be. Um, so we're, we're gonna move, we're gonna move to, uh, to to your theater in a moment, so we can get to, to the regional part of this. But I love I love talking to you about this because. Um, it, it just makes me feel that I am not crazy for what I've been doing for 25 years. Um, Daniel, what's your story? Uh, tell us tell us a little bit about how you uh, who you were before you became the part of a contemporary theater of Connecticut. Yes, thank you. Uh, 
nice to see everybody. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it is uh, it is so interesting to hear Joe's story and how everybody there's an, I, I think that everybody in theater has their own unique story at, at, at you know there's there's no no two people have the same path to to either you know performing or producing or directing opening a theater. Um, my story is that um, that I have always worn uh, many hats in life. When I was uh, when I went to college, I went to a small liberal arts school uh, in outside of Boston called Brandeis University, um, where I was a pre med student. Um, I was also a theater major, so I was a pre med and theater. Um, and uh, upon great great combination, always yeah, you know, yeah always totally. Uh, uh, senior year at Brandeis, when I was you know about to graduate, I thought to myself, do I I, do I have what it takes to be an actor in New York? Could I move to New York and, you know, and I had no professional experience, obviously, being a, a college student. Um, so in my, and I loved theater so much, um, but I was a math and science guy. And in my sort of juvenile college brain, I thought, I know what I'll do. I'm going to go to dental school because dentists likely have an easier schedule than a medical doctor that I could still do community theater um, when I'm when I'm a dentist because I was not ready to give away to give up theater altogether but I didn't think that I you know I didn't know what skills I had that I could actually move to New York so I did I went to Tufts University School of Dental Medicine uh, also in Boston um, and in my and I loved you know I loved it I loved it uh, what I was studying, um, but I really did miss theater. And in my second year, end of my second year at Tufts um, Dental School, I <laughs> saw an ad in the paper uh, that Les Mis was auditioning for their new Marius. And, uh, and it was a big thing. And I was like, oh my God. And, and, you know, being fearless because I had never auditioned professionally before, I thought I'm going to, I'm just going to like tempt fate and I'm going to go to this audition and I'm going to see what happens. Big like open call, right? thousands of men there, not like not equity, you know, it's crazy. Anyhow, fast forward, I, 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 I booked Les Mis and that, uh, that completely changed sort of the trajectory of my life. I left, um, I dropped out of dental school. I moved to New York um, and I was starring on Broadway all of a sudden. Um, and my, you know, and my life was just completely different. I had a fairly successful Broadway career. Um, I, I you know multiple Broadway shows and national tours. I worked a lot regionally. Stephanie Pope and I, um, who I just love seeing here, we were in the original uh, Velma Company of Chicago together. I was Mary Sunshine. Um, I, I had you know I had a great. Uh, you were Mary Sunshine. Oh my oh, God! I, you were a countertenor. I, yeah. Yes. I, that that is yes. I was a countertenor. Holy yeah. cow! Um, but funny but, you don't look like a countertenor. What does that mean now? <laughs> 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 Anyhow, I um, so I guess the point is, is that I always wore many hats. You know, I've, I've had like, I'm a math and science guy. I am a performer. I was always curious in directing and producing. I'm a business, you know, so um, let me, let me get focused. So essentially I, um, oh no, <laughs> yeah, basically when I was working as in New York as an actor, I also, I, I also opened a, a company, a, an educational company. Um, and that quickly became a very, very large educational company um, where I, uh, it's essentially a, a tutoring agency. Um, and um, and I, it was funny because I was like fulfilling these sort of two parts of my, of my brain and two loves, math and science and also theater. Um, and this, you know, I, I realized that I understand business and it was, and I understand how to create things, not, you know, not specifically just um, in the arts and theater, but I built a business from, from nothing. It's a, it's actually still a very successful. Do, uh, do you guys realize you're like the, the perfect speakers for Theater Resources Unlimited? Okay. You're like, you're like everything that we stand for. Yeah, right. <laughs> like, I could, I, I didn't know, I didn't know all this. <laughs> it's like, yeah. really? Yeah. This is what we teach people. <laughs> They're we teach cool. people that yes, you you just because you're an artist doesn't mean you can't understand business. Oh no, you must actually. And we That's also true. basically try to ex ex explain to artists that you don't hide behind I'm just an artist and expect to survive in this business. No, that is you are you are that is absolutely right. Um, anyhow, there became a point in my life in New York where um, I started to transition out of performing um, and into directing. Um, and also writing my own uh, shows. Um, I had a, a couple of small shows on tour. Um, Steven Schwartz is a, is a very good friend of mine um, and gave me a couple of really incredible opportunities, um, which really helped me 
um, uh, grow as a director uh, and as a writer. Um, anyhow, I moved to Ridgefield, Connecticut um, about 10 years ago. Uh, and I quickly got involved with a, a, another theater here called the Ridgefield Playhouse, where I began their Broadway and Cabaret series. And it became a very, very popular series here in Ridgefield, Connecticut. And what that told me was that there was a, an appetite in this community in Fairfield County for really like Broadway caliber theater. The Ridgefield Playhouse is not that. It's a performing arts center that um, does over 300 one night performances a year. I wanted to open an equity theater. Um, and so I did. I pitched the idea to the town. This is like four years ago. Um, a lot of work, a lot of fundraising. Um, the town loved the idea and supported it. And um, I got myself a building, raised millions of dollars, uh, and opened ACT of Connecticut. We were just starting our third season when COVID hit. Um, and, um, and I know that's what we're meant to talk a little bit about, which I'll, I'll wait for that. But, but yeah, it was, it was a really challenging year, and I'm just excited to get back to normal in September. You're muted, Bob. Yeah. Sorry. Yes. Now, now I'm unmuted. Um, so you actually, you actually created your own theater. Uh, um, show you didn't. <laughs> no, <laughs> you had something to build on that had been there since 1927. Let's talk a little bit about the, about the history of, of your of your theater, Cape um, um, Cape Cod Playhouse. Am I, am I getting it right? Uh, just the Cape Playhouse. Cape Playhouse. Yeah. Oh, it's not. Oh, Cape Playhouse. Okay, you don't put. Okay, got it. Yes, out on Cape Cod, it's just the Cape. It's just the Cape Cape Playhouse. <laughs> so tell us tell us a little bit about the, the his, what what you know of the history of the. Uh, you don't have to go back to 1927. I mean, you, but you know. Well, you know, it's fun to actually go back to 1927 because on um, opening night, the place is packed. Everyone was very excited. A bunch of cars um, pulled up and they parked in this little uh, teardrop shaped uh, grass area that's in front of the theater, and um, everyone was excited to you know see their first theater. Um, Basil Rathbone was starring in it, and um, the I remember him. Oh yeah, and everyone's sitting down in their seats, ready for the show to begin, and uh, the curtain goes up, and it starts to rain, and uh, the building was still uh, somewhat new in that space because it had been moved from down the highway, and um, it actually rained inside the building. <laughs> the roof wasn't quite. Uh, tight so um the rain came in through the building but everyone was so excited that they just propped up their umbrellas in their seats and watched the show so um and i i feel like that uh <laughs> that's kind of a good story for the playhouse it's just kept going um throughout all these years and through so many things and um yeah it's it has spurred the careers of so many people um betty davis actually started as an usher at the theater and then of course went on to be betty davis um and uh, Julie Andrews, actually, if you see that film star that uh, she has done, that is actually, there's a scene near the end that is actually on the Cape Playhouse stage, and it still looks like that. Um, and it's amazing. We kept up the original lamp post. Uh, there's one original lamp post from uh, the grounds of the theater, and uh, we have moved it indoors, and it's there. And you can uh, stand there exactly where Julie Andrews was. and. Um, you know, give her big speech where she tells off the director and storms out the door and you can do all of that uh, because the place still looks the same. It's really remarkable. Gertrude Lawrence um, was there for a very long time. It was basically her second home and uh, along with Richard Aldrich. And um, so it just has so much history to it. And I think it's amazing to to build on that. But also, you know, it's it is a, um, you know, the building is over a century old and um, and we're reaching a place now where it does need to, you know, come into a new life, really. And uh, I think COVID has really highlighted a lot of things about that as well, uh, which I'm sure we'll get to. But um, so COVID forced you to actually look at things that you that you maybe wouldn't have looked at otherwise. Yeah, or well, you had you had time to look at them actually, because I think when you're running a theater, you don't have time to really think about what what changes need to be made. Yeah, exactly. I, you know, it's it's always been a summer theater. So uh, we do six shows in 12 weeks, Fast and Furious. Um, so and then the rest of the year, it would close its doors. But, um, you know, in today's world, if you are running a nonprofit theater um, and we're not only the theater, uh, but we have multiple buildings on a 22 acre campus. Wow. Um, yeah. And it's a lot to keep up. And all of that has you know, become more expensive along as shows have become more expensive. And so um, to to run a full nonprofit organization on just 12 weeks is uh, has has become a little 
untenable. And so, um, you know, it, I think in years, it was sort of starting to be realized before I got there. And then once I got there, I've really kind of driven home that we need to make this a, really a year round uh, business. Remind um, me, when did you start? I started in 2019, at the very beginning of 2019. So um, that season had already been chosen. And, um, and I stepped into that and it was fast and furious to get uh, from there uh, to a season that opens in June. And, um, and we went through and it was a very successful season. And I had all of these plans for 2020. 2020 was going to be great. And uh, that, was, that was basically your first season. It was uh, be yours. Yeah, that was going to be the first one where I, I was part of it from the beginning. But um, yeah, and then uh, COVID hit. And so it was a big old uh, change in direction there. And um, now here we are at 21 doing something totally new again. Well, let's let's actually. I'm going to dig in a little bit into something. Um, we'll get to, get to Daniel in a second. But what is what is your your business model at at the Cape Playhouse? Uh, uh, subscriptions. Uh, is it is it mostly a subscription model? Uh, we do have subscriptions. Yes. Uh, we also, since it is a vacation town, basically, uh, the Cape is very vacation. Um, we also offer uh, basically a half subscription that we call a flex pass. So we, we try to push a lot of subscription type products as we can. Um, and uh, so, yeah, it's definitely a subscription base that we try to keep growing. And um, the Cape is actually starting to get more and more year round inhabitants. So um, that's encouraging to see. But uh, but again, in terms of business model, like I said, it's really only a summer theater. And um, so in, you know, with uh, with the advent of COVID and everything, um, there, there were a lot of things to look at. And since we are, the building's over a hundred years old, unlike Dan's place that is, you know, really, um, brand smack spacking new. Yeah. You know, and I think, um, like, I think it's remarkable what they have been able to do through this time. I, I, I think I said in the last time, Dan, you and I were on a thing, I was like, they are the model to look at. I mean, they were continually doing things throughout the entire pandemic. Um, you know, and it it made I, it made me realize really all of these projects and um, technologies and things that we had said we wanted for our playhouse. It was just all the more highlighted that um, you know if you want to future proof yourself, you really do need to dive into those things. So um, so we we really sort of decided to um, to take another look and and really think about the future life of the playhouse, and that has been a lot of our focus in this time. What has supported it? I mean, if you only have a twelve-week season and you have to, you have to maintain it for twelve months. I mean, it's, it's it doesn't it doesn't go away for, for when it's when, for the thing for the, for the time that's not those twelve weeks. Um, is it uh, just uh, do you have a not-for-profit? Do you get do you get funding or or do you have uh, just a very strong solid donor base? Um, you know, we we certainly reach for every grant that we can. Uh, we so you, do have, you are a not-for-profit? We are a non-profit, yeah, absolutely. Um, so we reach for every grant that we can. Um, I installed a few new things when I got to the Playhouse because I really wanted to cultivate the community as well. Because I think uh, for a regional nonprofit, you need to really be tapped into your community. They need to feel like it is their theater. Uh, because it is. that You wouldn't be there otherwise. So. Um, so I, I did a lot of uh, things in my first summer there in 2019. I, I passed out comps to strategic groups and um, and I started a new um, student ticket program. And then I started a student membership after the student ticket program proved successful. Um, I started a, a new thing with tickets that I, that I called single seats because um, our rows would fill up and there would be these random single seats open in really good spots in the orchestra. So I created this whole campaign of um, like, you know, do you want to see the show and your partner doesn't? Or do you want to go with that friend, but you don't want to sit next to them because they talk the whole time? Take a single seat, you know? And, uh, and we were able to really fill these little holes in our theater last minute um, with these single seats. And, What's your uh, capacity, by the way? Uh, we fluctuate between about 515 and 530, depending on whether we have an orchestra uh, in the pit or not. Okay. So, um, yeah, so it's a small theater. The stage is quite small. Um, but what is lovely about it is that um, the intimacy of it, it actually, Dan, I think it feels smaller than your theater. I was just in yours again recently, and it feels smaller because yours has such a nice layout to it. Um, 
but uh, but ours is it has this really lovely sense that allows things to play really intimately. Um, so plays are beautiful on our stage. Musicals do really well, especially because you can tear it, you can pare it down and just really tell the story. Um, I think things play so well on the stage; it's beautifully set up for that. Um, but yeah, about about five fifteen, five thirty in there. Um, we're going to come back to the shutdown. You you hinted already at that there's a big difference between how you dealt with the shutdown and how how Dan did. So let's let's move to Dan and, and yeah. fill us in a, a little bit on on what your mission was and what your purpose was in creating this creating this theater and and how you thought it was going to work until shutdown showed up. Yeah, no, for sure. It, um, uh, Ridgefield, Connecticut, and Fairfield County. You're a little is... soft. Can you? Can oh. you? Yeah, yeah. Let me. Can you hear me? Is this okay? Yeah, it's still a little a little soft, a little oh. softer than, than than Joe. That's okay. We'll, Joe, we'll do. can you hear me? Okay. Oh, okay. Odd. I will. I'll just talk louder. Um, uh, so yeah. So Richfield, uh, Connecticut, and Fairfield County is um, it, it really very very supportive of the arts. Um, and I was really I I wanted to make. Um, my community, this community that I love so much, an arts destination. Um, and I thought that with the advent of an equity theater that that would you know, help, uh, help in my journey to help make this uh, an arts destination, this town and this community. Um, I, uh, like I said before, I, I, um, I petitioned the town to, um, to help me with this. And uh, like I said, they gave me uh, a building. Um, it was up to me to, and my partner, uh, Katie Diamond, who's the executive director of the theater. And my husband, Brian Perry, uh, who's the resident music supervisor of the theater. Brian is the, uh, Brian was the conductor of Wicked uh, for a decade and Jagged Little Pill, uh, and he'll go back to Jagged Little Pill in September. Um, but anyhow, the three of us worked really, really hard to fundraise and to get the community on board. Um, and we made this really very, very cool state-of-the-art modern theater, complete with the turntable um, and you know all the bells and whistles. And um, and. And yeah, and it, and the community ate it up like from the get go. I mean, they, people showed up, um, a lot of support, a lot of um, season subscribers, and uh, and it was a terrific first two seasons. We did, we opened, of course, we had to open with Mamma Mia in order to fill the seats, right? Um, and that was sort of the goal. Like I wanted to, I wanted to get people there and then start to get a little daring with the programming right but at first i wanted them to trust me um you know it, it because you know how that goes it's like titles that they're familiar with and then i can introduce them to something maybe that they're not that familiar with then i can actually introduce them to a new works and then you know things like that so um it's about educating the the, the community and and to um like i said have patrons uh trust the theater um but we, uh, Mamma Mia, Evita, Stephen Schwartz is working, um, Austin's Pride, which uh, is a sh terrific show that was actually part of our New Works uh, series in year one. And it was so successful as a New Works that we actually made it uh, that following season as the main stage show, Erin Craig, um, who many of you know. And she's uh, here, actually. Erin is here. Hi, Erin. Yeah. yeah. I, I just want to say, because somebody's asking in, in the chat, it's, it's the, it's ACT at CT. It's uh, a contemporary in theater at, in, in, at Connecticut, in Connecticut. Of Connecticut. ACT of Connecticut. Of, of, okay. yeah. ACT of, C, of CT. Yeah. If people are like Googling it or whatever right now, it's ACTofCT.org. Um, we're also a not-for-profit. Um, but yeah, I mean, the, we, we were having a great, a great uh, couple seasons. And then, of course, when COVID hit, we were just starting another new, brand new musical called Nickel Mines. It's a beautiful new show. Um, and... Um, you know, while we were not sure what was going to happen, what I did know is that if I did not continue to engage this community and to um, keep the programming going, that I, I, I could not guarantee that we would be able to return. I mean, nobody knew it was going to be this long, of course, but, you know, we were just building our, our audience base. We were just getting these season subscribers. We were just finding donors and having these great sponsors. We have no endowment yet, right? We're too new. Um, and, uh, and so it was, it was my commitment to the audience to keep them engaged and happy by still producing uh, theater in a very different way. Um, we were the first uh, equity theater in, uh, in the country, actually, 
to be given permission to reopen uh, with an indoor musical. That was last October, actually. Um, and that we did that with the last five years. And part of that was because we worked really hard on the safety and return plan um, that, that the union um, liked. Um, but it hasn't, you know, it's been really, really challenging. I think that like shifting, we've obviously shifted all of our education uh, and, and conservatory programs and classes to the virtual and remote type. Um, and then in terms of the main stage shows, um, like I said, it was last five years was our first main stage show uh, back, and that was at 50% audience capacity, but we also live streamed that every night. Um, and I wasn't sure how that was going to go. I didn't know if our, uh, my audience would um, enjoy that, and it turns out they did. Um, and it turns out that we were actually able to spread a wider net on people that maybe didn't know about ACT before um, and that are now lifelong fans because of the work that you know they've seen us do over this this COVID year. Um, aside from last five years, we did a, a another Stephen Schwartz show called Snapshots, um, which was uh, also live streamed. It was a, a terrific success for us. Um, and we also did, we did other interesting things, like we did a very, very big concert version of Into the Woods, which we partnered with the Ridgefield Symphony Orchestra. We, our town has an orchestra, a terrific symphony orchestra. Um, and um, yeah, it's all about sort of building community and, and uh, helping one another in this, in this county, in this town. Um, what is interesting is uh, that just a couple of weeks ago, Ridgefield, Connecticut uh, became the first uh, became deemed the first uh, town in Connecticut to be a uh, art and culture destination, arts destination. So my goal four years ago was to have that happen, uh, and it was just recognized um, by the state of Connecticut. We are the first uh, in the state. So, yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty terrific. It's nonstop work, but it is, um, it's very rewarding and and, and great. I'm surpri surprised that Connecticut hasn't acknowledged good speed or some something. It's it's. That's surprising to me. I'm sure that they've acknowledged Goodspeed, but in terms of being an arts destination, there it, it has to fit very specific criteria. There has to be a certain number of like museums and historic. Uh, oh, oh, oh! I see. It's the, it's, it's, it's the city, of, city as a whole. Yeah. Okay. Got that's it. That's exactly right. Yeah, within yeah. a certain amount of, of, of mileage. Yeah. Interesting. Um, Jessly and Jay, uh, keep it's it's a it's a big old chat there. Uh, so go through there and see if there's any questions that, that we uh, should be answering. Okay. Somebody to say something, Jessly or Jay? Yeah, I've been going through them. I haven't seen any any questions. Okay, good. All right. Um, so, uh, Joe, you had you had said that you 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 contrasted yourself to to Daniel. You said that you you basically haven't really been using the uh, the virtual medium. Um, you didn't you didn't make the transition there. Do you do you see the do you see Zoom as ever being part of your your plan? Has the world gotten so used to it in the past year and a half that maybe, maybe some of us really are expecting to to see that as being an element of what you do? Uh, you know, it's an interesting uh, discussion. We we did use uh, Zoom a little bit uh, for our education classes. We were able to put those online and continue those um, throughout the the first summer. But when COVID first hit, um, and no one knew what was going on, we decided to do some free. Facebook classes um, that people just really appreciated. And since that was appreciated, then in the summer, we actually took our education program um, onto Zoom. So uh, so we did use it in that sense, but um, but not in the in the sense that Dan was able to with his with his theater and do these amazing, you know, I saw snapshots and like, it just it, it it was amazing what they were able to accomplish. Um, with such an old building, it, it was an extra struggle for us to um, create that safety plan for the union and that everyone could agree upon uh, was a safe place to work. So um, so we just had some some added uh, hurdles there. Um, you know, if we wanted to um, update infrastructure of the building to reach the safety plans, it which would have been an enormous task because the building's so old. So. Sorry. Okay. What was the, what was the uh, what are the basics of, of the safety plan that 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 were challenging for you? Um, there was just a lot. There were a lot of uh, infrastructure and space requirements. So like uh, the HVAC filtration and all that. Yeah, you know, with, with an old building, obviously, um, 
it's it's <laughs> very old HVAC system um, <laughs> that we're dealing with and and blowing through and whatnot and uh, and and it's been pieced together as the building has sort of um, evolved over time too. So some components might have passed while others didn't, but because others wouldn't, the whole piece wouldn't. So um, so that was a big big thing to figure out. But also it was the timing of it all, right? We're we're typically a summer theater, so. COVID hit right before the summer, really. And, and we kind of had to cancel our summer season because no one knew what was up, what was what, and everyone canceled the summer. Um, and then come that fall, our audience wasn't used to us doing anything. So, you know, in a way we, I guess we kind of benefited in a way from our, our past model um, in that they, they weren't expecting something from us in the fall, winter, spring of this year because we don't typically do anything anyway um what we were able to do then in that time uh, as we had started in 2019 when i got there we started a, a really strong push toward um a fundraising campaign for our annual campaign in the winter right just really diving into people and making that a big touch point with us um for people even when we're in our quote off season and um and so we just dove head first into that even stronger in uh in 2020 since we didn't have the summer you know we, we weren't able to connect with our people in the summer and so uh we use that as an opportunity to connect even more with them uh with a giant fundraising campaign that had a really strategic plan to it to reach groups of people individually and in different ways and that was how we were able to financially barely squeeze by um in that dark time so um, it took a lot of uh, reconfiguring because we were not able to um, come up with some ways of using digital technology. Daniel, uh, what, what actually did you, did you do creatively, uh, virtually? What, what, what did that look like? How was it, how was it accomplished? Um, were people, was it talking heads and frames or was it staged? What, what did you do? So the last five years um, was, like I said before, it was on stage um, at with a 50%, uh, that, at that time we were allowed 50% audience capacity, which is for our, you know, we're only 182 seat theater, right? So that was like 90 people. Um, so it was- And, like, and yet your, your, your theater feels bigger than, than shows. <laughs> you must come, You'll, yes, it's, uh, it's very, very spacious actually. It's, it's, it's a, because we were a new, you know, it was the, the, I couldn't touch the exterior of the building because it's a Philip Johnson building, which is a mid-century modern, you know, we couldn't touch, but we completely gutted the entire, it was not a theater before, it was corporate office space really. Uh, Schlumberger Oil headquarter company inhabited that uh, decades ago um, and it had been vacant and it, floods and I mean, it's just sitting there. Um, so yes, millions of dollars to renovate it to make it feel that big and spacious inside. It's actually not, um, but it feels that way. Um, anyhow, last five years, so 50% uh, audience capacity, and we invested in um, so we we invested in a company that uh, that was really able to capture it so that it felt as though um, it was you know it was a three camera thing, right? It wasn't just like a you know an iPhone set up in the back with Zoom that our audience, because you know, I, I didn't think that that would be successful for us. That is terrific for lessons and for speakers and things like that. But I, I couldn't imagine doing, I didn't want to do, uh, our, I didn't want to present theater that way, um, especially in our stage. It just, you know, I don't, I didn't, didn't think it would work. Um, and so we spent, you know, we spent some money on, um, on this this terrific like video equipment video company in order for it to look so spectacular and um, it looked like a film in a way uh, and it was really really great. Well, and then, was, the, yeah. was the company a, a film? They were a video company or they were filmed? What what, what yeah, was they, their what were their skills? Their their skills were um, were film and and theater. Actually, they 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 captured a lot of Broadway shows um, uh, and I think that they have done like PBS great performance stuff. Um, things like that. So, wow. so very, very skilled in uh, in cap capturing theater and filming theater live. You don't um, kid around, do you? Well, you know, listen. When you're this young, in terms of a theater company being this young, I, like I said earlier, I, 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 
if I didn't, I mean, listen, I can also, I persuaded my board to allow me to do this because I, I, I can't, I could not guarantee that we could reopen in September if we didn't keep the audience engaged, as I kept, you know, as I said. Um, after the last five years was snapshots, that was just remote, that was just virtual, we had no audience for that. Um, and so because of that, um, that was actually, that actually felt in a way like a, a, a film shoot. We had um, several days to capture that um, and uh, and do some editing on that. Um, and uh, yes, it, it actually, I don't, Aaron, who is on this will probably yell at me tomorrow for saying this, but um, it was actually so terrific that it, it, it's, uh, it's been purchased by Broadway HD uh, and will, will uh, be on demand for, for many years. So it was, um, you know, it was an investment and it was risky, but it has paid off and it will continue to pay off. Um, so yeah, those were our two big, big um, sort of remote things. And of course, we also, um, I, did a week, I did a weekly web series uh, called Happy Hour, where I would bring in, uh, you know, felt a little bit like David Letterman. We'd bring in like Broadway guests and, uh, and do shtick. And it was a, a terrific thing. We did that like weekly. We did a web series called Storytime for our younger viewers, where um, Broadway, uh, professional actors would read stories, children's books to, to kids. So, it so, was, you, so you, you did more than stick your toe in the water of virtual. We went all out. We went, we, <laughs> we had one, uh, we had one live stream that Steven Schwartz was a guest on that, uh, that over 50,000 people watched. Is that, Aaron's mention is reminding you about Broadway Unwrapped. Broadway Unwrapped, yes. What it, what it, she's reminded me. Broad, so Broadway Unwrapped was, yes, was a, um, an event we did for our patrons and for the public, which was just live streamed. Um, and it was sort of a gift, uh, like a holiday gift to our patrons, which sort of um, revisited all of our productions to date, how a show gets made, how it's cast, how, how you choose designers, how a set builds a, you know, how a shot builds a set, um, all, all these things. And, and people loved that so much that that's sort of going to become an annual thing. So, you know, like I said, we were able to really cast a wide net um, and we, we claimed people that we would not have been able to claim uh, if it were not for, you know, for, for COVID and having to go virtual and remote. It's pretty impressive. Uh, good for you. Um, so, uh, Jesley, did you want to um, bring up questions that somebody, somebody was raising? Yeah, I see two questions in the chat. So Susan L. Cohen uh, has a question for Joe. She asks, how did the Cape Playhouse's involvement with the Christmas Carol on Zoom work out? Um, hi, Susan. Um, yes, so that, that was another virtual piece that we were able to bring um, to our audience. Uh, we, because we didn't have any live shows over the summer, um, well, I should back up one second. Um, in the summer of 2020, when we realized we couldn't do our shows indoors on our stage like we had wanted um, our full season, um, I quickly like got got on the mindset of what else can't we do? And also on our campus, we have the Cape Cod Museum of Art, the Cape Cinema, and a restaurant. And I have always believed that the more people come to this campus, the more they will want to come and it's beneficial for all of our organizations. So I've always been trying to pull us together into partnerships and things that we can do together that just help uh, connect our audiences to each other so that all of the businesses are thriving because I think it's best for all of us. So um, we actually oddly have one of the largest parking lots in uh, on the Cape. And so um, I called up a company that did um, inflatable screens and we made a drive-in uh, for people and um, we were able to do drive-ins um, I think we did every Wednesday night um, and we made it a partnership with the cinema and the museum and any money that we made we split among the three of us um, just so that we could you know it was important to me to keep them running too and um, so so we did that and we also popped up a stage on one of our lawns and just did a, a speaker series not shows or anything we, we brought in um you know interesting writers and athletes and it was a mixture of people um you know who had connections to the community so we called it mass roots so people who were from massachusetts in some way and had a connection there um and then we had another night every week that would be local bands so we could highlight some more local people and uh bring them in and get them doing things so so we did have a, a sort of small stage outside so that that was what we were able to accomplish very quickly 
um, to do something in the summer. Um, but again, at those at that time, we, we opened that outdoor stage uh, being allowed 100% capacity. And after our very first concert, it was cut down to 50. So we could really only get 50 people at a time um, on the lawn. So, but it was just, you know, something that we thought we could do to uh, remain connected to our community. And then in the winter, again, as part of, um, you know, just really trying to be alive and driving home that fundraising that we needed so desperately, um, we were able to make a partnership with this company. I'm so sorry about the sirens. As you can tell, I'm in New York. Um, yes. But uh, we, uh, we started this, uh, a, oh my goodness, um, a partnership with some producers who, um, who had captured this amazing production of A Christmas Carol with Jefferson Mays playing all the roles. Oh, and, that. I yeah. knew that. And it was, I, I genuinely, when I first heard about it, I thought, man, I wish I thought of that. Um, Cause I thought it was such a great idea that they captured this thing and they used it as a way to help, uh, you know, local regional theaters um, who were struggling at the time and just to help keep theater audiences engaged in this time. And so um, they approached us and um, worked out, you know, we worked out this partnership thing. They were offering it that um, other theaters could sell tickets and stream it. And, um, and it was a, a deal with their company that profits were shared in, in a certain way. And so, um, yeah, so that's we we popped it up on our on our website and we sold um you know we got people doing tickets to it and and people really seemed to enjoy it but it was that was a partnership that um that sort of outside producers came up with that idea and we were just very happy to participate sandy silverberg saying you must be in washington heights because he's hearing the same same sirens that you're hearing oh, i'm upper west they're just everywhere in new york oh, okay <laughs> <Help us. laughs> um so <clears throat> I was going to ask you something uh, before I got distracted by the sirens. Um, I can't remember what I had a great question for you. <laughs> it's like, give me a second. Um, so are there any other questions? Yes. I, Jane Dubin wants to know, are either of you considering adding live streaming to your season or adding subscribe subscriber add-ons like audio plays for, um, for the future? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, actually, my, my question is going to be, how are you, how are you planning on reopening? And I, the other, I, the question I originally was going to ask you was, it still takes a lot to survive a shutdown in terms, just financially. Um, it's, it's financially pretty devastating. So I assume that you must have gotten PPP loans to, to help get you through. Uh, you, you got both of them, both loans. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And was there any other government help that, that was available to you that, that we might not have known about that, that, was something nice that somebody was doing <laughs> no for well for uh, for act um we yes two rounds of ppp um of course um there was a state grant um connecticut uh, that uh for for arts organizations that we received and then of course we um have applied for uh for the shuttered venue for svog um which as uh you know as joe probably knows has been an, an epic disaster um and uh so we're have you have you gotten through the application process because i thought that was the big the big problem was that was just so complicated no what? that was that was the big problem um and then they fixed that and um but they've run into more i think something like thirty thousand people uh, organizations have um applied and i think something like less than 50 have been paid or have been given uh, any any money they're just um there were a lot of not only tech glitches with the thing but now processing um, and yeah, the, the SBA, um, the small SBA is moving. Small Business Association. Yeah, they're moving who is managing the SVOG uh, now to a different department. So hopefully um, that will help. Actually, Congressman Jim Himes uh, was at our theater yesterday um, and we were talking all about it. And um, yes, so, but it looks like we're, we're on our way to, to receiving that. Um, we also have some really terrific um, supporters in our community. Um, that um, didn't want to see us go away and wanted us to continue to produce. And, but yeah, I mean, the loss was about a half a million dollars um, for us. Um, and of course that affects how, what the future season looks like. Um, but, you know, I, we are confident. Well, that's actually, that's worth actually highlighting for a second. So, so basically uh, the, the effects of COVID are, are still going to be with us going forward in terms of the fact that you don't, you don't have as much as many resources for creating the seasons as maybe you normally would have created your seasons. Is that true for you, Joe? 
Yes. You're, um, you're, you're, you're planning conservatively, let's put it that way. Very much so, yes. Um, yeah, it, uh, we just have to. Um, you know, it was a very difficult year. We were um, absolutely amazed and heartwarmed by the, um, the response of our community um, in 2020, as, especially in the winter. Um, when we did our big fundraising drive, it was interesting. Our um, our average donation, the actual amount, went down, but we had so many more people donating that we actually were able to raise more than usual in that short time. So, um, so we were able to hit the goal that we needed in order to continue on into 2021. I'm pretty sure our average donation actually went up for the past year. Uh, people- oh. Wow. People were paying more attention to us than they had because they come here every week on Zoom. So, yeah. so oh, we know we know who, who True is. We know that what they're doing now, um, which has always been an issue for us. We we just like I don't know. No, people just don't know who we are. Um, so, so go back to going back to Jane's question. Are either of you considering adding live streaming to your season? Let's let's put it this way: What are your plans going forward? Now that we're we're seeing the light, um, how are you going to be reopening, and how difficult is that given the re- the requirements uh, for for reopening? Yeah, so it was a really uh, difficult moment for us. Um, because too, we're in the Cape and we always bring performers from New York. That is our history, right? We bring big Broadway people out to Cape Cod. That is, that's our brand. Um, so because that is our setup, it, it makes us have to plan way in advance for our summers. So it was January of 2021 here where we were trying to plan the summer and where COVID was at that point, it still was not in a good place, you know, um, and and no one knew how this vaccine rollout was going to happen, how many there were going to be. Like it, it was still very unknown, and uh, so we actually were not going to do anything this summer. We were going to put the summer to use in a different way of doing some construction projects on our building uh, that needed to be done, and that we realized, especially in uh, with the advent of COVID, that we needed to do this work on the building. So. Um, we were just going to shift our focus with the organization to make people realize too that it's much more than a theater. It is so much more than that. And um, and so we were going to shift our focus to doing some construction on the building and um, and on campus and a lot about our future planning. And um, and then as things you know in the last month or so um, started opening up very rapidly. Um, the board wanted to reconsider and see what we could do outside. So it was a fast and furious, you know, literally three days to that I had to give them a plan and figure out what we could do. Um, and so I immediately just went to, um, you know, it's got to be outside because our building is too old to be able to accommodate the safety protocol for inside. Um, so we've got to do an outdoor stage. Great. What can we do on an outdoor stage? It's got to be small because the stage is going to be small. Um, but what's still exciting? What is this year about? Like, what would our audience like? What can they connect with? Because it's a very specific audience that we have too. Um, and I still want to do that Broadway brand. I, I want something that's splashy, but I want to do something that starts off really small because I still don't know where we're going to be when we begin. Um, and we should push our season back instead of starting in June. We should start in July so that it, you know we have a little bit more time for vaccines to happen and things to calm down. And like all of these things had to race through really quickly. So. Um, we are going to be doing um, two outdoor shows this year. We're doing Lady Day at Emerson's Bar and Grill, um, which I was really excited about to, you know, especially after this year, to just highlight a Black female icon. Um, I thought it was really important in this year. And of course, then Andre Day at the time was winning all these awards and <laughs> getting so much praise for her uh, rendition of Billie Holiday. And um, so I thought that was a really great one. And it's, you know, basically two people. Um, and we could definitely do that even if COVID was still a thing and we could do it outside, um, you know, with a small audience and we could pull that off. And then for the second show, I wanted something that had, um, a little more music. I want everything to be very music forward and, um, and we could get some other great names into and whatnot. So we're doing songs for a new world, um, as our second one to, um, to, you know, just highlight the world of musical theater too. Um, so 
Um, so that's what we, that's our intention. It's just a sort of a one month stretch as opposed to our usual, um, you know, two and a half, three months um, that we do. And, uh, and just two productions instead of six, but it's something that we can offer to our audience and, um, and give them a real production again, because that was what we heard loud and clear from them was they, they couldn't wait till we got back up on the stage. Um, Have you considered anything to, you talked to earlier, you hinted at the fact that it might not be a bad idea to find a way of, of using the theater for more than 12 weeks. Have you been exploring that at all, expanding what you can do beyond the 12 weeks, just so you'll have a source of income to get you get you there to, to next season, to next year? Yeah, exactly. So uh, the the first step is a lot of construction on the building. So okay, that's so that something that we're, that's, we're that's intending. That's what you're doing. Yeah, you know, we need to weatherize it. It's not weatherized at all. So in the winter, oh. it's actually colder inside than it is outside. Mm. Um, so, um, so that is something that, uh, that we need to fix. And then of course, get heat into there so that we can use it in, um, in more months of the year. Um, so that that's something we're really driving at this year with our future planning that, um, that we have really dove, you know, dived into this summer. So, um, so I think that's going to be really great after these shows are over. That is a big focus for us is, um, what do we need to do the building to be able to run more than just 12 weeks? And, and that's where a lot of our attention is going to go to. Um, and, and this is, this goes back to what we said at the beginning, which is COVID give you, gave you time to think about things that you didn't have time to think about before. Yes, exactly. Exactly. And, and again, I think we, uh, the gift that keeps on giving COVID. And again, I think we benefit a little from our, um, our past model where people didn't necessarily expect a show from us. You know, Dan, I, I know, I keep hearing from you, you felt the pressure to need to be there um, for your audience because you needed to keep them engaged year round. Our audience wasn't used to being engaged year round. So we kind of, we had a different, um, you know, set of circumstances we needed to meet. So, but, um, but moving forward, it is something we need to do is expand our, our year so that we can continue to run year round. It's, um, it's a big operation and uh and it, it's that's where we need to go absolutely so jane to your question about um you know if we're going to include live streaming it's been a big conversation because we do get some great people in our theater and really exciting shows um so i it, you know it's something that as we look in our future planning and we're going to start you know capital campaigning with some big projects it's something that we're talking about including you know what what would we need to do that? What pieces of equipment could we add as we do this construction on the building that would just allow for that so that if we wanted to add a live stream of a show, we can, absolutely. Or should something happen again where we can't go indoors with an audience, we can still do a show and stream it. Um, would that be great for our children's shows? You know, our, our audience, they live all over during the rest of the year. So if we start doing education classes in the fall and winter, whatever, and the kids want to put on a show, can we live stream that to the grandparents who are in Florida? You know, these are the things that we're starting to think about with that technology. And, um, and I think it's something that is very much in our consciousness as we start thinking about the future planning. Absolutely. Same question to you, Dan. Are you Dan or Daniel? Just so oh, it doesn't right. matter. It, either. Okay. Either. Okay, Dan. Um, in terms of going forward, what are what is it that you have to you have to have in place in order to to reopen gracefully and successfully? And are you planning on incorporating what you've learned in the past year into into your future plans? Right. No, for sure. I mean, the the, the good news is is that we're not reopening from from scratch. Right. We have been. We actually were only dark for a couple of months. We've been. We've had an audience for for months now. We, we you know. Um, like I said, we just closed uh, Into the Woods um, just two weeks ago. And I mean, there was a wait list of 400 people that we couldn't get in because uh, we were sold out for that. So um, we were at 50% audience capacity up until just a couple of weeks ago. Um, Connecticut is pretty, it's relaxing a lot. Um, we actually could be at full uh, capacity. Um, and uh, you know, we, we, we don't know what the union requirements, the union requirements are, change weekly, um, it seems. Um, but um, what we do know is that we are allowed to mandate um, that we can hire, we, we can make it a, a 
we are allowed to ask for vaccination status to for actors and 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 designers. Yeah, I, was, I was wondering about that. Yeah. Yes, yeah. so we can we can just we can make the decision to only hire um, those that are that are vaccinated um, to keep everyone safe. And with that, you still have to create a you know go through the equity the steps and the application then the worksheets and making sure that they're looking over your your plan. But you know, right now there it's with equity. There's there's a um, there's a, an approval process for a, a not a fully vaccinated company, and then there's an approval process for a fully vaccinated company. Um, we will be a fully vaccinated company um, at, come September when our first production starts. Um, you know, the things that we've had to adjust or that we will, that we made the decision to adjust is that we're not going to do three, you know, it's not going to be Les Mis and uh, you know, huge shows. It's not going to be that this year. Um, we're going, there, there'll be, um, slightly smaller, you know, where, where maybe we would have 20 people in a musical, um, maybe there's going to be 15 people, in a musical, right? So, or even smaller. So it was about choosing uh, titles that, um, that were, uh, you know, a little bit smaller. Um, the other thing is in terms of like live streaming, you know, you can only live stream if you get permission to live stream, right? So like when we want to, I wanted to live stream into the woods, but we didn't get permission from MTI uh, to live stream because Sondheim doesn't want Into the Woods live streamed, right? So, um, so it depends on the title that you that you choose. It's not like we can say yes. Like all of all of twenty one, twenty two is going to be live streamed. So, guess what? But it's a, it's a question you can you can ask when you're when you're planning. That that's right. So you so you have to that is in, when when choosing a uh, when choosing titles and when choosing the season, it, it certainly is something um, that you apply for, um, and that is plays a, a part in the decision making process in terms of what we're what we are going to do. Um, I, I wish I could tell you what we're going to do. We're announcing it in two weeks. And uh, again, Aaron Craig, our producing director, who is on this Zoom, will uh, have a heart attack if I if I announce it. Joe's laughing. Um, so yeah. So I'm not, I. Uh, but we're. It's it's going to be a spectacular season. I'm actually really excited about these shows that we're doing. I I I can say one thing. Um, when when COVID hit, um, I think that I said before that we were just part of our. We have a uh, we have a part of our mission is to support new writing teams and to um, to foster in new projects and our new work series is a big big part of of that and and we love that um, uh, like I said Austin's Pride started as a new works for us at at ACT and then was main stage at our at our theater there was a musical called Nickel Mines um, about 2006 um, Amish schoolhouse shooting. Um, maybe some people remember when that actually happened. And this is a beautiful piece that uh, Andrew Palermo um, put together and helped to create. Um, and uh, we were just starting the tech period when COVID hit and we had to shut that, uh, you know, we had to obviously shut that down and send those people home um, and then sort of reassess before actually reopening, like I said, in October. Um, we, I, I really felt strongly, we felt strongly that this is a really important piece of theater um, that, um, that we, I didn't want to let go. So that actually, Nickel Mines will be a part of uh, next season, um, again, because of our commitment to- uh, And, and to that you're allowed to say that though, right? That I can say, that okay. one I can say. Okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yep, the other ones I can't. Mm -hmm. um, I, I'm, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm gonna ask another question in, in a second, but uh, to Joe, um, because I've, I've got a room full of writers. Um, does Cape Playhouse have any, any plans or any thoughts about doing uh, original works? It's, I, I would think it's not your audience, but I, I thought I'd ask. Well, I think it's wonderful what Dan said at the beginning, actually, that uh, you know you need to you need to cultivate an audience into knowing that they like to see new work, right? And and our whole past has been works that are already on Broadway. So for us, it, that's something like from the beginning when I arrived on campus, because I am very passionate about new works. Um, and from the moment I arrived, I said, oh my gosh, we have this arts campus. Like this, this needs to be an arts destination. We should have a festival. We should be doing um, New Works festivals like twice a year. Like we've got multiple stages and spaces here. We should just do it. Um, so that's something that we're really, really considering um, in our future planning here. But um, it's, it's something that we haven't done yet. So I think we're gonna have to build our way into it much like how Dan laid out, I think, um, where 
if you know i think our first sort of new work is going to have to be something that um that people have a touch point with already you know that the subject matter is something they already understand or it's about someone they already know um so that they feel comfortable going into that and um you know, maybe the first thing we do is a reading. Maybe the first thing we do is just a few songs from something new, but just starting to cultivate that audience um, so that they hear something new and they think, oh, wow, that was really cool. And, and I got to be the audience who heard it before New York this time. And and I, I think we need to push them more into that way, but it's um, it's something we, I think now the board is is really on board with, if you will, um, okay. in doing new works in, in the future because, um, we have a great space for it, and um, and I think as you start trying to move into more year-round programming, that is a diverse set of programming that we can offer that you know makes a reason for us to be doing a show in a different time of year, right? This is when we do our new works, and so the summer can stay those big, um, you know, Broadway blockbusters, if you will, and um, and then we can have a different section of the year where we do new works and we you know premiere new shows and new people and then we're cultivating new people for our shows in the summer as well so um, so it's so your heart is there you, it's what it's what you'd like to do and, and you're looking at a way to build towards that yeah yeah right now we we don't exactly have the infrastructure for it because again the the weeks and months that we can use the building um we already use it so yeah. beyond that it's a little uh it's a little difficult and uh we don't fit in, you know, equity's got rules of temperatures backstage and stuff too. So it's, um, it becomes difficult for us. Yeah. And Murray Davis had one other question you talked about the requirements for your theater space and for your casts, uh, for reopening. What about your audiences? So we were, we're not going to mandate, um, you know, we're not going to ask vaccination status for the audience. However, every, the audience is still meant to be masked. Um, so while performers will not be, um, because they won't be um, the audience. The audience will be masked, um, and that's that is still the plan um, moving forward. It was it's what we have done, uh, you know, into the woods. Like I said, that just closed the entire audience for the entire run for every seat was was masked. Um, and the as this, the moment the cast stepped off the stage and was not on stage, they also were masked. There was no intermingling with the audience. There was no meet and greet. There was no, you know all of all of these things. We really really, I mean, that's the other thing about it. Um, to, to Joe's point and about, um, you know, what the safety and reopening plan is, is it just about HVAC? Not, it wasn't. It was also about bubbling casts. And um, I mean, it's, you can't even, uh, it, it, it was, <laughs> I mean, I never want to do it again. It, it, it was, it was nearly impossible. And that's, and I understand why many regional theaters made the decision or had to remain dark because you just, it's like, it's almost impossible what, um, you know what, what we're meant to do so um we're just really lucky that we had the support to do it you know that's a really good point too dan about the bubbling because for us that was really difficult because of our housing out on the cape um you know it's uh we don't have our own housing um we we rely on um a few different houses in the community that we have worked with a lot um and they didn't meet what was required so um so that was a big consideration too i'm glad you brought that up that that was a, that was really difficult for us to meet uh, we couldn't yeah we have a very big question but it's going to take too long because i think I've, you guys have given me more than more than the time that i that you you promised me um so um at some point just know that larry is what larry is wondering <laughs> how you produce a show that is both live in person as well as live streamed look at the question and we'll give it some thought, but I don't think we can dive into that. It's a, it's a, it's probably a very long answer. No, you're, you're, you're muted, Daniel. Yeah, I was just reading it. Um, uh, so yes. So the question is for a show you produce that is both live in person as well as live streams, like the last five years, how do you market the live stream part? Is it shown at the same time? Yes. So for last five years, um, it was yes. If you if there was an in person audience there on Friday at eight o'clock, you were meant to also tune in. Everybody's given a, a unique link um, on a specific portal or, or hosting you know site. Um, and so yeah, as soon as the downbeat happens, it went live. Um, and so that's how last five years worked. The price point of the ticket was the same. Um, and it, so you know if it was meant to be fifty dollars in person, it was also fifty dollars. Um, live stream and we didn't have a problem. I mean, I believe it or not, we, we 
it, it was fine. Snapshots um, was a little bit different because as I said, we didn't have a, um, a, a live audience for snapshots. It was just virtual, it was just remote, but it played like a theater schedule, right? So we had, it was like you buy tickets for Thursday at seven o'clock, Friday, eight o'clock, Saturday, two o'clock. So people still had that experience. And that was a little bit of a lower um, uh, price point because we didn't have, you know, we weren't in person. So, um, so that's, you know, that's why we thought to do that. Um, did I answer the question? I'm looking. Yeah. Yeah. I think uh, hopefully. I didn't get on because no one ever saw oh. Um, so that was my husband. Uh, <clears throat> so um, I'm going to, I'm just going to wind up right now because it's six, it's six sixteen, and you guys were, have been very generous with your time. I appreciate you coming on and, and joining the, this community gathering that we do every week. Um, thank you for being with us. Uh, reminder to everybody that uh, we don't turn down donations. If, if you want, if you want to donate us, you to donate to us. You can uh, go to True Donate T R U Donate dot com. Um, Joe Nelms confirmed that that's correct and put it in the in the chat for us. And um, I just want to thank you both for being here and thank you for being so right right on target for what we, what, who we are and what we do. We, we basically are trying to tell people that they can be artists and be in the business at the same time. And that it's really good for them to actually understand the business. So you guys have really jumped in uh, the deep end of, of the business. You're, you're running theaters, which is not an easy thing to do. So um, thank you for all the information that you shared with us. And Well, I think it's great that you make that point because I would just say before we go, Yes, everything needs to be approached as a business. Every single Broadway show that happens is its own startup. That's how it needs to be approached, especially in today's world. And so theaters as well, you know, it sounds like, Dan, that's how you that's how you started it, right? You had this goal of what you wanted to be within a certain amount of time. You had a business plan. You went to the right people. That is exactly how you need to do it. Everything needs to be a business and you can be so creative in the way that you form your business and the way you reach your goals. And what's great about coming from a performer background is that as you start on that journey and weird things happen, you can creatively solve them, right? And you can find a new way to still reach your goal or your goal might become something new. And, and I think people who have that artistic background can accomplish that so much more smoothly. So if you are able to apply your creativity and your artistic side to business, I think you're all the more successful for it. So it's wonderful that you are a place that is combining those two things. And yes, everyone on this call should not only, you know, you, I think you said you don't turn down donations. You should tell everyone on this call to donate because we need people who understand that that is that culmination of those two things, of being an artistic mind and a business mind, is exactly how we are going to keep moving this industry forward and keep it alive. Thank you for that. And uh, I hope some people will, will uh, go to true, true donate, uh, true, true donate, true donate, and, and help us out. We're, we're, we're doing okay because you've continued to support us through this whole, whole period. And uh, I'm very grateful to the community.